Hi, and welcome to the Future of Dermatology podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Farah Kamengar, board certified dermatologist. We are here to talk about anything and everything dermatology related. You'll hear from me and my guests who are dermatologists, physicians, experts, scientists, residents, and medical students in the field of dermatology. We publish weekly, so if you like what you hear, hit that subscribe button and show us some love, and thank you for joining us. I am so excited for today's episode. I've been waiting a long time to interview Dr. Reed Berger, who is fantastic, and she is an obesity medicine physician. Um, and Dr. Reed Berger is the medical director of obesity programs, associate clinical professor of medicine and surgery, and physician nutrition specialist at the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago. And she does spends a lot of her time treating patients with uh, all sorts of different therapies, um, but including GLP agonists in bariatric surgery. And GLP agonists are so new and hot and there's so many questions about it. And there's so many questions that have come up in our other even dermatology talks specifically with us being curious about how we'll engage with these therapies with our you know, psoriasis patients and uh, other patients that have to do with inflammatory skin disease and metabolism. So I'm just so excited to have her here to learn more and delve deeper into this field rather than kind of, I think, more of a superficial knowledge that I think a lot of the dermatologists have. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Berger. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's good to talk to you again. And uh, yeah, I've been waiting a long time for this as well. Yeah, and I've known Dr. Berger for a long time as well. We've worked a lot together on different health tech initiatives, and I've gotten to know her over time, and she is just also so fantastic as a person. So I'm just also happy to have you here for that reason. But I think I've never actually kind of tapped into your knowledge regarding this field and exactly what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I would just kind of love to hear, we could probably even just start from a general sense. Um, what is sort of the makeup of your, of your clinic now? Is it mostly still a good amount of bariatric surgery patients? Is our GLP agonist kind of taking over? Uh, so I'd love to just kind of get a general view of, of, of what your day-to-day -day looks like now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've been doing obesity medicine for over 20 years. So when I started at UI Health, it was actually all obesity and nutrition. And then as time went on, it became, because of our population there, it became a little bit too much for me to handle all like overweight, underweight, everything. So then I just started to focus on obesity and at that time, you know, there were a few medications out. So I did obesity medicine with medications and surgery. And now um, in the past few years, I'm again, because of our population and there weren't a lot of medications out with that little bit of a lag time, I'm now primarily bariatric surgery. Um, and then right before the GLPs came out, we had to decide, am I going to be all bariatric surgery or am I going to be bariatric surgery and medications? And we decided that endocrinology was going to do the medications and I would do bariatric surgery. But again, as time came out um, and the GLPs became available and so exceptional, then I became doing more you know, of the GLPs and surgery using the GLPs. I use the GLPs a lot after surgery in particular. Um, and then since the pandemic, I was always um, in person. And then since the pandemic in that one weekend, as you probably know, like, you know, with proximity and everything, I transitioned the entire program to just um, telemedicine and our patients love it. I've never had a single, com single complaint. So that's what I'm still, still doing. So I do telemedicine pre and post bariatric surgery, and then the GLP is mainly for after surgery, weight management. I agree with you. I've, I've, I found telehealth so helpful too for our, our patients with a different kind of chronic things that we see, but are on kind of met the medication management type of visit. It's perfect. Telehealth visits are like the patients love them. They're, they don't have to drive all these miles and all this. And it's just so easy for them to check in that I find patients check in more with us and then they get better outcomes because they're seeing us more. So I, I exactly. that's, that's amazing that you've been able to kind of transition more to that. Um, and, and a general guide, I, I think everybody kind of knows about GLP agonists now and a little bit about what they do, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on just even if you want to do a quick overview of which one you use mostly, their mechanism of action, just a little bit more about the medication because you just know so much more about them 
than the rest of us kind of superficially mm-hmm. know. I think what I always try to educate people on, and mainly it's my patients, but a lot of times it's also primary care providers, is when you're talking about the GLPs, you have to distinguish between the ones that are used and approved for obesity and then the ones that are approved for weight loss. So I have a ton of patients that come into me and they're like, you know, I want to take Ozempic for weight loss. And I'm like, well, do you have diabetes? No, I don't have diabetes. Well, then it's not going to be approved, you know? So, so when we talk about the GLPs, the main ones are semaglutide in general, which is available as ribelsis, which is um, just a PO medication. It's not an injection. And then there's Ozempic, which is an injection used for diabetes. And then there's Wagovi, which is the same thing, just a little bit of a higher dose at the max. Same medication as Ozempic, it's an injection once a week, but that one is for weight loss. And then we have the new um, GLP, GIP agonist, which is like a GLP, it's a, it's a dual agonist, so two hormones. And then those are um, Monjaro, which is for diabetes, and then Zepbound, which is for weight loss. So again, you know, my patients come into me, they want Monjaro, they want the injection, and we can't, we can't do Monjaro, we have to do Zepbound. Um, and then those two are the same doses. So there's no, there's no change in the doses versus Ozempic and Wagovi, you have a little bit of a higher dose. And then there's the older ones, which are um, liraglutide, which is Victoza, again, for diabetes, and then Sixenda, which is for weight loss, but those are a little bit less effective and they are every day. So that's that's the first thing I do is just try and educate what medications they're going to take, and I do believe that that is what created a lot of the shortages that we're we're hearing about now, is because a lot of primary care physicians were prescribing Ozempic and Mojaro for weight loss, and they shouldn't be, you know. So it should really be the proper Wagovi and Zepbound. So I think that's that's something that's that I really like to explain it. to my patients and other providers. That's actually super helpful to know just to, just for that even one public health fact of prescribe the correct one so that our patients with diabetes are not running out of medication. That's that's such an like, important distinction exactly. actually to make. And I actually hadn't realized there yeah. is an oral semiglutide as well. Is the, Has that been around for some time or, has, or did it come around around the time of the injectables? That's been around for some time. And then that one currently is just for diabetes. But I think there are talks about having it to be available um, or some form of it, again, same kind of thing um, for weight loss. So, so that would be nice because some patients are afraid of the injection, but I find that when you're talking about weight loss, they, they really don't have any fear. Exactly. I, th- I think you were mentioning the between pills and injectables that uh, I think people just want whatever works best, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the whole like injectable fear goes out the, <laughs> they have no goes fear out the door after that. when it comes to weight loss. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah, that, that's actually really interesting because for a long time with like our psoriasis and eczema patients, there was this sort of this discussion of we have these biologics that are injected and how do you get over the injection fear? And like it was, it was decades of us talking about this. And then when it came out for an indication like weight loss, I feel like no one even batted an eye. Right. <laughs> Everybody was like right on board to, to start the injections. People that were even just maybe, maybe they shouldn't even be necessarily using this medication. That's yeah, that's very interesting between the orals and the injectables. And on our side in dermatology, one major issue with the peptides has always been just the breakdown when they're taken orally. Um, I'm guessing they're doing lots of mm-hmm. work around this probably just because it's the, these molecules are peptides, right? The GLP agonists. So in theory, mm-hmm. you should be mm-hmm. able to ingest them orally as well. But I'm curious, how, how is the efficacy working for the diabetic patients between the, the PO semiglutide versus the injectable? I don't know, because I don't really, you know, prescribe the POs at all. Um, yeah. But my understanding is that the injectables do work better. 
do work better. Yeah, you know, it kind of makes um, sense because it doesn't. You probably mm-hmm. get a lot more uptake rather than having some of it be digested in the, the GI tract too. Which kind of leads me to to the next point right, of right. of absorption and all of that. So we know the patients with GLP agonists, they're just they're basically not able to eat as much. Correct? Is that they kind of have less of the hunger mm-hmm. sensation. Kind of what's going on in the body there when they start these medications? Like how long mm-hmm. does it take for it to start to kick in and then? When do they kind of get max effects? Right, when do they right. start really, really suppressing the hunger? Kind of what goes on mechanistically? Right, right. So, so GLP, the hormone itself, slows gastric emptying, sends a signal to the brain that the patient is full. So, when they first start taking it, and that's the reason why we start at a lower dose and we titrate it up. So, technically, we shouldn't expect any weight loss until they're at like those maintenance doses, maintenance slash weight loss doses. But from what I see and just from the literature so far, but definitely from, I always go by what I'm seeing, you know, in practice is that they do feel fullness right away. So that at, at the titration doses and everybody is so different that some people I have that we don't even have to get them up to a maintenance dose. And, and they're losing weight and they're doing really well. So the prescribing guidelines are every month you increase their dose as long as they're tolerating it. But then you can also say, I'm only going to increase the dose when you feel like you need it. So I've kind of been doing that, mm-hmm. um, increasing the dose when they feel that they need it. Um, but then because of the shortages, I kind of have to put in all the, the upcoming doses and I kind of have to play that game yeah. where you know, what, what dose we're going by is really like what's available. I mean, sometimes we have to go down a dose because the higher doses aren't available. So, so I, th- I hope that in the future, you know, I'll be able to prescribe how I want to right. and patients can take it how they're supposed to, but to go back to your question, they should feel that fullness. And that those are the side effects that everyone complains about, you know, of the nausea and the vomiting. And usually that just happens when you first increase the dose, like that first week, they're going to complain of some nausea, um, not really vomiting, but more just nausea. I mean, nausea is pretty expected. And then they get used to it. And then, then we go to the higher dose and then they get used to it. But in my experience, most of my patients really tolerate it very well. Oh, that's great. I haven't had, I haven't had any complaints. Like I haven't had to stop it, you know, or, or like go back down a dose or delay yeah. titration because they have any side effects. And, and then yeah, my patients not pretty, only pretty feel well that they feel full faster, but they think about food less. So that's nice too. That's great. Yeah. And then like my next question there would be when you do start patients, you know, they're going to probably have some level of uh, restriction of food, maybe right away, or maybe in a week or two, however long it takes to get there. How do you counsel them on what nutrition to focus on now? Because they've, I'm assuming they've been probably eating anything they want, normal diet, but now we know we have like a limited amount of time per se, or maybe that's not even the right wording for it, but kind of limited capacity to get in actual nutrients um, so that their body is able to keep doing what it needs to do and it's not kind of underfed. Um, How do you kind of deal with that? Or what's the advice there for patients starting these therapies? Mm -hmm. So definitely if they are having side effects, you know, the things that slow, the foods that slow gastric emptying are um, protein, fat, and fiber. So that's going to make it even more effective if you're doing foods like protein, fat, and fiber. But, you know, if they're not tolerating it, you might focus a little bit less. But in general, I am always going to focus on protein for weight loss. You know, I believe in every, everything for weight loss. But if you need to kind of tailor the diet, like I always say to a patient, you know, if you're going to choose between a food that has 100 calories, I want you to choose the food that has more protein in it. Because, you know, protein is more thermogenic. It helps you um, also maintain lean body mass, which is incredibly important when losing weight. I mean, we hear about, I'm sure you hear about, um, you know, Ozempic face and like all that kind of stuff. And it's really not, there's no Ozempic face, it's weight loss face. Um, you know, and so when they're losing weight, you know, you find that if, if it's kind of slow and steady, that's a little bit better, but with, with some of these medications, it's not going to be slow and steady. So you do want to focus more on 
protein in order to just maintain that lean body mass when losing weight as much as possible. I mean, you're always going to lose muscle and fat, but just, you know, to lose as much fat as possible over muscle. And then do you uh, have the, and I'm totally going to come back to the Ozempic phase. We spend so much time talking about it as dermatologists, uh, but do you also have them? Yeah, I want to hear about Yeah, I'd be curious to see what you think. And um, just curious if you also have anyone modify or start exercising, like how do you incorporate that? Maybe some people are already exercising, mm -hmm. you don't make changes. Maybe some are doing a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. Do you want them to do more? Do you want them to stop or decrease in the initially? Like, how do you kind of address the uh, physical activity piece of it as you start one of these medications? Right. So my priority always, and this has always been my thing with weight loss medications, is they always have to be approved or at least have seen the dietitian and get down the basics first. So I won't do a medication unless, you know, because... Again, with the patient population that I'm dealing with, a lot of them really need to know the basics. You know, they don't know that like drinking foods with calories or drinking, drinking beverages with calories is not good for you or this, you know, the basics. So I just want them to go over that. And so same thing with exercise. A lot of my patients aren't, you know, aren't able to move that much. So the goal for me is to at least do something active every day. And that could be doing something you know, if they're wheelchair bound, just doing something in their wheelchair. I mean, that's that's fine as well. Um, but I want them to at least make activity important every day. So that's always going to be a goal of mine at the very beginning, just thinking about activity, making it a habit every day. Um, and then wherever they're at, I definitely don't have them stop it. You know, I'm, I'm definitely going to have them continue as much exercise as possible. And then really the importance of exercise comes when they've lost a lot of weight and then they're trying to maintain that weight loss. So, you know, I always try and explain that the body, the basal metabolic rate is based on your height, your weight, and your age. And, you know, your height and your age don't change much, but your weight does. So as your weight goes down, your basal metabolic rate goes down accordingly. And you can't keep decreasing your calories. So you have to, you know, when we talk about calories in, calories out, you have to increase your expenditure in order to continue to lose weight and to maintain that weight that's lost. So exercise is important in maintaining the lean body mass and also maintaining the weight that's already been lost. That's a good point because a lot of the patients you treat probably are starting out with really high BMIs, I'm guessing, if they're coming to your clinic. So maybe exercise is not even right. necessarily, it's more just movement, right, in the beginning until you're able to um, get to a point where you're able to do more excessive exercise and maybe the joints are feeling better with weight, less weight on them and able to kind of move more. Um, and do you have at your right. patients right. supplement with anything specifically as well? Or is it just like general guidelines of just your general multi daily multivitamin or, um, or, or the dietitians that they see along with you? Are they having them do anything specific to make sure they kind of keep up the nutrition piece if they're taking in less orally? Mm hmm. So, right. So most of the, it's, it's, this is always a hard question for me because I have so many bariatric surgery patients. So vitamins are necessary, you know, so for a bariatric surgery patient, it's the multivitamin with iron, the vitamin D, um, and then the vitamin B12, those three are necessary for just a general weight loss patient in general, I would always just recommend a, a general multivitamin. And then most of our patients, just because of the obesity and, um, you know, where we live and that kind of thing, we do check the vitamin D and um, I do have them supplement vitamin D if it's low. B12 is not necessary in a patient just having weight loss, you know, just, just general weight loss, but it is necessary for a surgery patient. Yeah. Yeah. And it's actually really interesting that you mentioned you are having your surgery patients start the GLP agonists after as well. That's actually, that's a, I think it's a new thought mm -hmm. that, I've, that I've heard of. It makes sense, right? Because you still want to keep the weight off even after. How long do you wait after surgery? I mean, I'm sure not right, not, not in the right, you know, post-op period, but like, is it a few months after? Or do you kind of give them time, see how they do with just the surgery itself, and then decide if you need to add a GLP agonist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's a great question. I think it's very patient dependent. Um, I mean, in general, patients will lose their maximum amount of weight in the first six months to a year. Um, so I kind of see how that's going. 
And again, we need to see, you know, why are they not losing weight? First, make sure it's not something with the surgery anatomically that needs to be fixed. Um, and then, then, yeah, we can usually after a year is where I'll consider starting, starting okay. one. Um, but then again, there are patients that are weight loss medication non-responders and there are weight loss surgery non-responders. And we're starting to learn a little bit more about this now. So, you know, I could have a patient that is just a medication, a drug non-responder. Uh, yeah. So then, you know, it's difficult. And that's a lot of times why they will seek out surgery is because we've tried medications and none of them work. Um, they're doing everything else right and they, they just don't work. So we have surgery then. But then we also have the weight loss surgery non-responders. For some reason, they don't respond to surgery. So then, you know, hopefully medications would be something good to, to add in. But yeah, um, I do like to wait just because like the stomach is healing and, you know, the fullness and all that. Like they, they, should, they should have that fullness after surgery, you know, because especially after like the gastric bypass, you know, the GLP is is increased just by the gastric bypass alone. So they should have that kind of automatic, you know, Full GLP feeling, effect yeah. anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. So for mm -hmm. them, you kind of think about it like a six, six months to one year for the GLP agonist patients. What's the timeline that you kind of think about in your head of when they kind of reach their maximal. Um, and the question I'm kind of getting that at that is kind of related to the ozempic phase. Is it faster or are the GLP agonist patients mm -hmm. reaching their maximum weight loss at a faster rate you think versus like the bariatric surgery or other modalities? Mm -hmm. I think it's about similar. Um, I do think, you know, the GLP is definitely losing more weight than any of the other medications that have been around. Yeah. Um, and people lose weight, you know, differently. I mean, that's why, and I'm sure you see this in your practice as well with the, you know, paniculectomy, the ex, the sagging skin. I mean, that's, that's a major question that I get all the time. It's just the pre-surgery appointments, you know, what are we going to do with the sagging skin? And it's kind of the same thing. Like, we just have to see yeah. people lose weight so differently. I mean, there are patients that lose, you know, 100 pounds and they, they look fine. Right. They don't have sagging skin. Yeah. Their face looks the same. So it's really very patient, patient dependent. Um, but I do find that, you know, if they do lose a lot of weight quickly, they tend to have more, more sagging skin and more of the, yeah, you know, quote, the speed face. Definitely, it's by... I agree with you that the, yeah. that speed definitely needs, seems to be like a factor in it. Um, and going more into those epic uh -huh. face now, because I think that's, that's a hot topic for sure. We have the debate yeah. between ourselves as Durham's of, yeah. is it just simply really fast weight loss, which it probably is mostly just that, or is there something else going on? And the other things people can talk about is we know you kind of lose a little bit more I don't know if you lose more protein with GLP agonists or you just, you tend to lose protein as well, but that's one of those myths that's kind of out mm -hmm. there, right? That, well, you can lose protein, you know, on a GLP agonist. Um, so you kind of think, is it more mm -hmm. like a protein, less absorption of protein, less collagen building? Like, is there any bit of that? Is there any evidence that there's something a little more going on rather than um, like maybe something specifically more nutritionally or peptide related? Um, as opposed to like the, uh, just general, you're losing weight. So your face looks like you're losing weight. <laughs> right. I, not that I know of, I mean, that would be something I'd have to look into more, um, to be honest, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that it's anything protein related again, because I find that the patients that are focusing more on protein are doing better with weight loss. Yeah, which makes so, sense, right? You know, the pro yeah, yeah, like their their body composition is being they're mm -hmm. making more muscle, I'm guessing. They're having a higher basal metabolic rate, metabolism. So like going back to the basics of kind of weight right, loss. And then the fullness yeah. of the protein. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So how do you how do you how do you treat, like, how do you deal with the ozempic we, face We kind phenomenon? of, we do the same things we always do. If someone comes in with hollowing somewhere in the face, we use our fillers, our biostimulatory, like things like PRP, lasers. So for derm, it's kind of just 
more business. So it doesn't necessarily change kind of yeah. what we do. But then from the nerd side of it, it's interesting to think about. It's sort of like, well, is there something going on? Is there more collagen breakdown happening? Um, and then because sometimes mm -hmm. med medicines come out and then their mechanism or their side effects then kind of lead you back to learning a new you know, mechanism or new pathway. So I think that's, that's, that's the really interesting thing that, uh, yeah, if you hear anything, definitely let us know as well. But the treatment of it is exactly all the things you kind of mentioned is having patients to be lose weight at a slower rate, which they might not even want to necessarily slow that down. But um, actually, that's it. I, 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 it's, right, I'd be right. curious to know, is there a way to kind of slow it down? Like, do you have patients where they're like, oh, I'm losing too much weight, let's decrease the dose? Or do you ever get that in your in your mm -hmm. clinic? Not well again with the GLPs, it's kind of even hard to answer that yeah. question because of the shortages. Yeah. So it's like patients are so crazed about, right. you know, am I going to be able to get the next dose? And it's like, so I, I hope again that in the next few years, I'll be able to actually answer that question <laughs> intelligently. Yeah. Um, because now it's like, you know, can I, am I going to get the next dose? You know, am I going to have to go down a dose and, and all that, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. um, don't, I haven't had any patients that have had too fast of a weight loss. I mean, with bariatric surgery, it's funny because patients always are like, well, what if I'm losing weight too quickly? Yeah. And I'm like, we'll cross that bridge when we right. come to it because okay. it never comes yeah. to that, you know? <laughs> That'll be a good problem to have. You know, I, exactly, exactly. Because I could say, you know, and again, I've been doing this over 20 years. I could count on my hand the number of patients that have lost too much weight. And when I say too much weight, it's meaning too much weight that's comfortable for them, but they are still at a normal body mass index, if not even at an overweight body mass index. So it's not something that's concerning. It's just something that they're, you know, a little bit more uncomfortable with. But as time goes on after that two year mark, and I always tell them this, I'm like, I promise you, let's not, let's not go crazy with, you know, trying to gain weight because it will, it will come back a little bit. So, yeah. you know, don't freak Both out. And it, it always out. does. Yeah. And it's so interesting, the practice mm -hmm. management points that you bring up because there's the science and there's all the things we talk about. Then there's just the real life practice of medicine, which is really hard. And there's so many hurdles. So you're dealing with a lot of the outages. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's probably generating a lot of patient messages and a lot of, you know, the, just the practice of management things that, that we have to deal with. Prior authorizations, I'm guessing, is that something that your office is just super overloaded with? Yes. So at the beginning of all this, I was doing all the, my own prior Oh my gosh, you are a hero. And just recently. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, and bowing down if that's not visible in the, yeah. the video. I can see, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I can see. So, right. So I was doing, I was doing all of them. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and then it just became, I was like, you know, it's not that I need help with them, but I don't think that I'm doing the patient. I'm thinking I'm doing the patient a more of a disservice by doing them. And that, not the exact prior offs, but instead continuing the medication, you know, and if there's a denial, like I, I need someone that does this all day in order to deal with those kind of things. You know, they know how to word it properly and, and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, and there are patients who get denied for the medications and it's, it's frustrating. You yeah. know, I had one patient who was denied to continue it because she didn't lose enough weight. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, she was losing more than she's ever lost on with that. And she was a, a post bariatric surgery yeah. patient for many years post, and she was really doing well. And so that was really, that was really frustrating. Oh, yeah. Um, and it still never got, got approved. Oh my right. gosh. Yeah. Um, right. So yeah, so the prior authorizations are frustrating, but it's funny because at the beginning, and again, I think this was the reason I was doing my own prior authorizations, is that at the beginning, they they weren't being hard yeah. on on prescribers, you know, and and again, I was always prescribing them appropriately. I wasn't like doing Ozempic for weight loss, or you know, I mean, I was prescribing Wagovi for weight loss. Um but they weren't being hired on primary care, you know, providers for doing Ozempic for weight loss. And then, so then I'll get a patient that was prescribed Ozempic from their primary and they want me to continue it. And I'm like, I really can't continue it. And then the Wagovi gets denied because they were on Ozempic and, you know, so yeah. 
there's there's so much it's there's so much of the back end piece yeah. that I think is not visible because everybody talks about all the fun parts of the, <laughs> of these, but there's so much that goes into the nitty nitty right. gritty when, when these medications come out and the whole not con- prior auth denials for mm-hmm. continuation therapy that's new in our field too. We used to never have issues with continuation therapy. It was always like, well, it's hard to get somebody on oh. something, but when they're on it, then they stay on it. But we're seeing that kind of thing too, where they're on a biologic and then they're like, oh, well, we're not going to approve, you know, continuing, which is kind of crazy from a person that's been on a medicine to oh. then suddenly get, get to now. So we're, we're seeing that in our world as well. Um, and so, yeah, thank you so much for reviewing oh, wow. anything. And I'm just yeah. last minute things. I'm just curious about, are you still using any of the other, like, other the medicines that came before the GLP agonists, um, like the traditional oral meds and right. all of that. Is there still a place for those? Are you combining any of it? Um, and then the other question would be maybe like metformin mm-hmm. is one we always talk about because it has that like the potential longevity and all of that too. And we know it causes maybe a tiny bit of weight loss as well. But are those medicines still mm-hmm. kind of an, at play with what you do as well? Do you use those in conjunction with the GLP agonists or on their own? Right, right. So again, because of the shortages and the lack of coverage of the GLPs, a lot of times I do have to go back to fentermine. I mean, fentermine is the main one that I am using. Um, and it has, you know, I think, I think, was there just, well, I, I use it continuously. Like I don't, I don't just, if it's, if a patient is responding to it, I will use fentermine um, long term you know, if, if a patient responds. So Fendermine is the cheapest one. That's one that I use a lot. And usually if um, a GLP is not covered, then medications like Qsimia and Contrave, those are the two combination weight loss medications, which are both very effective. Um, Qsimia is a combination of Fendermine and Topiramate, and then Contrave is Naltrexone and Bupropion. So those are very effective, but again, if if an insurance doesn't cover the GLP, most likely they're not going to cover the um, the combination meds. Gotcha. So I don't, and 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 the contrary, I see again a lot of physicians that prescribe um, naltrexone and bupropion separately. They actually don't work effectively for weight loss when you're using them separately. Okay, interesting. Whereas with the Qsimia, yeah, yeah with Qsimia, when you use um, fentermine and topiramate those can be helpful for weight loss. So fentermine, you know, can help. And I I always say like, I always, when I'm talking to a patient or even other providers, I kind of say a weight loss medication is for mind hunger or abdominal hunger. So medications that make you feel full faster, like the GLPs, that's for a patient who, even though they do work on the mind hunger as well, but that's, that's really good for a patient who's like, once I, if I feel full, I'm gonna stop eating. That's not the case of most patients. Most patients, if they feel full, they're going to continue that physical fullness. They're going to continue to eat, and they're always going to be thinking about food. I mean, that's that's more what you know what I deal with. Like the patients that eat past the point of fullness, they're always thinking about food. So fentermine actually really works very well for that. Um, and then I sometimes, if fentermine, if they kind of plateau on the fentermine, topiramate, I, I sometimes will add that one. Um, and that one's off label. I don't use any other medication off label. That's the only one that occasionally I'll use off label um, is topiramate for weight loss. Um, and then metformin to me, you know, if they're diabetic, I mean, I, I would always recommend the metformin for them. Again, I don't use it like off label for weight loss, mm-hmm. but but definitely, you know, for PCOS and um, and diabetes or pre diabetes, I'm definitely going to recommend. And those. and the people that are so kind of- and, and you know. It's, yeah. yeah, the people that are on metformin for the right indications, do you notice much of a weight loss on it? Because there's been the kind of controversy of it doesn't really cause much weight loss, but now there's like, no, it's good for weight loss medicine, but does it actually kind of make much of a difference? Right. I haven't seen it. Again, you know, my patient, I think, is a little bit different of a population, but my understanding is to get weight loss, you have to make sure it's at like a thousand BID. Mm-hmm. And that's like the weight loss dose. Um I mean, I'll have to get back to you on that one, yeah. but yeah, I mean, you know, that would be a nice, a nice, you know, and, and you also have to tell them about 
starting it slow. I mean, I have so many patients that stop it because they had diarrhea you know, yeah. from, from the metformin. Yeah. Because of the so side effects. Know. Yeah. Yeah. You'll have some nausea, vomiting, but they're like, well, yeah, as long as I lose weight, that's, that's perfect. That's, that's okay. And then the one <laughs> right. that seems to be like a little bit of a stopper possible, um, possible deal breaker would be like a risk of cancers, things like that. And then there's that potential mm -hmm. increase in thyroid cancer, but in not in humans, but in mouse models, right? And it seemed to be at pretty high doses. Do you have any guidance or how do you kind of advise mm -hmm. your patients when they ask about that, that risk? Right, right. So I basically ask them, you know, do you have any personal or family history of any kind of thyroid or pancreatic cancer? If there's anything, then I don't, I just don't prescribe it. Um, I mean, that's, that's basically, I mean, that, you know, that's mainly the main things that we have to watch out for is that, that, her, you know, the history of the MEN syndrome, um, but any, any family or personal history of like any problems with the pancreas or the thyroid. And then I, I mean, beyond just like basic hypothyroidism, then, or I'll just refer to like the endocrinologist, at least for prescribing the GLPs in, in that case. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. That but, good. Um, mm -hmm. Perfect. No, that's, mm -hmm. it's, it's such an interesting yeah. overview of all these medicines. And I think we're going to learn so much more over time as well. So, and then we always end the podcast with yes. just asking about what you're excited about. We usually ask what the future of dermatology is, but here we would be the future of obesity medicine, these medications, um, any aspect of it. What, what do you kind of see changing in the future or what are you most excited about? Mm -hmm. Well, I am most excited about the GLPs. You know, there are going to be some triple agonist, three, three, um, you know, three, three agonist medications now coming out. So it's kind of like, you know, Monjaro and Zepbound being a little bit better than Ozempic and Wagovi, and now there'll be better ones out. So I think the injection medications are definitely going to be great in the future. I think honestly, what I'm most excited about is when insurance companies are more lenient in terms of the understanding of the coverage of them. Um, but then again, the shortages, I mean, that's like, I mean, honestly, yeah. more so than the insurance companies, I think the shortages are my main barrier right now. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's, that's so interesting with the, the triples. So it's going to be the GLP, mm -hmm. the GIP, and what's the third uh, receptor that they're... And yeah, glucagon receptor agonist. Okay. And so those will be helpful also for like fatty liver. Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. That's great. So that would be great. Cause yeah. I do have a lot of patients with fatty liver. Mm -hmm. We do too, mm -hmm. especially with our inflammatory yeah. skin disease population. There's a lot of that just inflammation everywhere. And then we, we've kind of always had that um, debate of, is it the fat cells first that are causing the inflammatory skin disease or the other where it's the inflammatory skin disease and all that inflammation that's around is causing all this like increased uh, adipocytes. So I think that's another field within our kind of subpopulation of derm patients that I'm super curious to see what GLP agonists um, end up doing. Uh, they, they, they might even be over time that all they need is a GLP agonist and not really even our focused biologics that we use for their specific inflammatory skin disease. So I think just, it's really oh, exciting. Yeah. It's like the, at the advent of these, these therapies, we're going to learn so much. So thank you so much for taking the time and, and teaching us yeah. all about everything that you do. It's fascinating and keep us posted with Ozempic face. If you feel it's a hot topic, if you find any, <laughs> anything new that comes out. I will. I will. And yeah, you do the same. And yeah, so great to chat with you. I was so excited. So I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to the Future of Dermatology podcast. Remember to hit that subscribe button and share the podcast with your friends. The more you share and subscribe, the more we'll be able to grow and share our dermatology knowledge. If you have burning dermatology questions, feel free to leave them in the comment below and we would love to address them in a future episode. And please note that this podcast is not intended to substitute for medical advice from your doctor.